about to leave already packing come with me i'm not really asking we'll get away to a place where we don't know about to see the world in action what we can be life with no distractions we'll get away this is what we Evening, everyone. It's Jim here at Tutor Do. Welcome to a live stream. This time, focusing on Unit Seven for BTEC National Business. The exams coming up in a couple of days' time. Uh, if you're joining us live, that is, and uh, it's on business decision making. And one of the things that we've had lots of requests on is just for a short live stream session for a chance uh, for learners to ask a few questions as we go. But most importantly, just to summarise the structure of the assessment what to look out for, and in particular, give you some feedback from uh, examiners and the examiner's reports and teachers who teach Unit 7 as to the best way to approach this exam, to give yourself the best chance of maximising those marks. So that's the idea. Welcome if you're joining us live. Please do use the live chat uh, to have a go at maybe one or two activities and also ask questions as we go. If you're joining us on catch up or replay, obviously we can't use the live chat, but please do take the chance to use the comments box uh, in the YouTube video. This is being recorded, and as soon as we finish this live session, uh, the whole video, the whole session will be available to watch on uh, on catch up on replay. So again, please use the comments box if you've got any questions at all about what we cover or about Unit 7. Let's take a look at uh, what we're going to cover tonight. And uh, basically, we'll start by, well, actually, we'll just do a quick true-false quiz to see what you know uh, about Unit 7. And then we'll go through the structure. We'll pick out from the most recent examiner's report, so just really focus on the last two main ones, what the examiner's saying is really important for people who are learners who want to do uh, really well uh, for Unit 7. And, uh, yeah, Ray was asking, can you explain the structure for the exam and what she should include? That's basically what this session is all about. We're going to go through each assessment focus in a little bit of detail, but probably start by just highlighting some of the key messages that you need to bear in mind before you tackle 
Unit 7. I don't know whether you're doing Unit 7 for the first time or maybe you're having a second go to try to uh, further improve your first uh, attempt and grade. Uh, so do let me know in the chat. I'll pick up your question, Joe, as we go. Good question. Why don't we just start with a little true-false quiz, though, as people are joining us. Uh, you know the score if you've been to one of these sessions before. The answer is either true or false. And this time, uh, the questions are going to be about Unit 7, which is probably good news, isn't it? Because that's what the session's all about. So here's your first one. The Unit 7 exam lasts two hours. True or false? What do we think? Give you a few seconds to think about this. Hopefully you know uh, you know the answer. And it may elicit some, um, some perhaps, uh, uncertainties. We've got some people watching us live on Facebook as well as YouTube tonight. So welcome if that's you watching on Facebook too. Most people, Simran, including uh, Matthew and Simran uh, and Rayon saying it's false. Let's have a look. It is indeed false. The exam lasts three hours. It's a three-hour exam. So you've got an extra hour, which is good news, isn't it? Next one. You'll need to produce two documents, a word processed report and a presentation. True or false? Somebody's very helpfully put into the live chat that took three hours is 180 minutes. I didn't know that. That's good news. Some extra minutes. Simran, uh, Maisie saying true. Matthew saying true. Lots of people are saying true. So the answer is, he says, hang on, let, let me, uh, I'm on my own here. <laughs> so the answer is indeed, it's true, isn't it? So two documents, both, uh, so you're clearly going to be using a computer to produce these. One is a word processed document. Most learners use uh, Word or something similar to produce that. It's a report. And the second part, uh, the second part of the, uh, the assessment known as activity two is a presentation. So slides and speaker notes. And typically most people use uh, software like PowerPoint or Keynote for that purpose. Good stuff. What about the next one? The maximum mark for unit seven is a hundred marks. True or false? Is the maximum mark in unit seven, 100 marks. Could be, couldn't it? Three hours. It's a long paper. Lots of writing to do. Not so much writing, typing and calculating, as we'll see in a few seconds. Maisie's saying, uh, oh, sorry, actually, <laughs> sorry, Maisie, I'm actually referring to your previous answer. Uh, Simran's come in and Matthew very quickly in there. Maisie all saying false. So if it's not 100, what is it then? If you're saying it's false, what is the maximum mark? What do we think? Anyone know what the maximum mark is that you are trying to achieve in those three hours? I'll give you a few seconds to have a think about that. And lots of answers coming in. Uh, and uh, I think Emma Dole's the first with the correct answer. It is indeed 70 marks, 70 marks. It's split, as we'll see shortly, between activity one and activity two, but a maximum of 70 marks. So plenty of time to go grab those marks. Well done, those of you. I think one or two of you are on a sort of a few second delay on this, which is no problem at all. Here's our next one. You can use pre-prepared file templates to speed up your work in the Unit 7 exam. Is that true or false? So load up the template. Off you go. Fill in the gaps. Click save. Job done. Am I hinting at the answer there? I'm not sure whether I am or not. So we've already spotted that somebody didn't know that the maximum mark is... Uh, 70. So that's good, isn't it? That's the whole purpose of this session, just to try to go through structure and some one or two things that you maybe didn't know about the exam. There's a couple of um, question marks after the word false and a couple of question marks coming into the live chat after the word too, true. So let me tell you the answer. The answer is absolutely false. You are not allowed to use pre-prepared file templates. And in fact, uh, the examiner's reports the last two times have both mentioned how some submissions have clearly been using pre-prepared templates and uh, that is considered to be exam malpractice and that gets investigated by Pearson. Now you might say well how do they know? Well it's quite easy when you're submitting a word file or PowerPoint to decide well, firstly to find out when that file was created and who created it uh, and uh, so don't do it. <laughs> so there should be no pre-prepared templates just start with a nice clean 
uh, Word document and a nice clean PowerPoint and away you go. That's setting those documents up is all part of the assessment. Lastly, I think this is the last one. To reach the highest marks, you must perform accurate financial ca calculations and then use the results of those calculations to support your decision. What a long question. True or false? What do we think? To reach the highest marks, you need to perform accurate financial calculations and then use the results to support your decision. An intriguingly named user on YouTube called Robo Sniper Cat. Can't argue with that. Has come in with uh, <laughs> with true. Matthew and uh, Simran, who seem to be answering the same at the same time and with the same answer, which is uh, fantastic. Both saying true, and the answer is indeed true. As we'll go through over the next 15, 20 minutes or so, it's really important to remember that in Unit Seven, it's a decision making uh, exam and or assessment, and they give you the financial information along with other information for a reason, which is to encourage you to use it, to perform some calculations, and then most importantly, to use the data, the results from those calculations uh, relevantly, hopefully, to support your decision. So that's why, and, and frankly, you can't get to the very highest levels in uh, most of the uh, assessment focus or foci unless you do that. So really important to, uh, to be confident and have a go at doing some financial calculations. So there we go, that's a really useful little true-false uh, activity there, which has elicited one or two uncertainties, which is good. That's what the session's for. So I'm just going to summarize what we've just covered there, and then we're just going to pick out some key information from what the examiners have said. Also, just take a look at uh, the structure. So Unit 7, we said three hours. Now, some centers, many centers, will allow you to take a break at some stage in those three hours, and that doesn't count in the three hours. That's up to the center and the exams officer to explain uh, if and how that works. Obviously, you must work independently, so you can't take that break to huddle around a table and ask, how's it going? So strict exam conditions. Uh, so, of course, some learners may have some extra time, uh, depending on their, their particular circumstances in terms of their, uh, their assessment. Uh, it's an unseen case study, so there's nothing you can do to prepare in terms of researching a market or industry. Everything you need is in the case study that you get given and the information you get given. You don't need anything else other than what they give you. Therefore, you don't need any prior knowledge of any of the markets or the products or the industries. Uh, just use what you're given. 70 marks, three hours. And the way that those marks are allocated is across two activities. So we've mentioned you've got two documents to produce. One's a Word document, a Word process document called Activity One. And it's called The Report because it's a report. And then, and that's worth uh, 52 marks in total. We'll go through what, where all the marks are shortly. Activity two is a presentation. So that's where we create our slides and supporting speaker notes. Those are worth, in total, 18 marks. So that's how we get to our 70. And very importantly, and I, just, I must emphasize this, you are not allowed to use pre-prepared templates to produce either the report or the presentation. You need to start with a clean document and use uh, produce that document as part of your time. Good stuff. Now, uh, a couple of people in the live chat just before we got going were asking what the grade boundaries are for this and what what uh, marks out of 70 you need to get a particular level or particular grade. And all I've done here is I've just summarized on the screen the most recent, the last two sittings. Obviously, we've missed a few sittings, haven't we, over the last uh, two or three years due to uh, lockdown. But these are the last two. And uh, as you can see, out of 70, if you want to get a distinction, you'll be you're trying to get in the ballpark of 53. Well, it's been 53 the last two times. I think uh, previous to that, it was 54. So it doesn't really change much. Uh, a merit, 37. So 37 to 52. Uh, a pass somewhere in the region of 22, 23, maybe 24 out of 70 gets you your pass. However, there are lots of marks going, including lots of marks for presentation and style and structure. So uh, there are lots of opportunities, good opportunities to earn marks. It's not just all about one part of this, one part of the assessment. Okay, uh, just picking up on uh, one of the questions from Robo Sniper Cap, Cat, I am confident that we are going to be covering that over the next few minutes. Now, so when you get into that exam hall, everything is there for you in that paper when you turn it over. Don't need any other information. And what you'll see is first of all, the set task, which explains 
what or who you are reporting to. So what the little scenario is, you might be an advisor to a, to a small business. You might be working for a, maybe an enterprise agency, a little scenario just to say who's your report to, what the business is. Does the business already exist? Is it a new business? Uh, it'll just outline the activity one and activity two requirements, but those are always the same. OK, but uh, make sure you read them carefully. And then you get into the really important bit, which you need to read really carefully around, firstly, about the market that this business is either operating in or wants to operate in. So this is very similar to sort of unit two bits of that uh, secondary research. You get some information about the market, the market size, the competitors, the products, the uh, all that kind of stuff. Some really useful information that will help you determine which option is best for the business. You'll then be given some more information about the business, perhaps about the owners, uh, who they are, maybe what their experience is, what their background is, maybe around the structure of the business. For example, is it going to be a partnership or a company? Uh, is uh, What finance do they already have, if they have any? If not, what finance might they have available? Have they already done some work to identify the financial opportunities for them? And most importantly, how are they proposing to operate and what do they want to achieve? So this is just like in unit two, where we were looking at aims and goals and objectives. There will be something in there that says what their aims and goals are. And it's really important that you reflect on those when you make your recommendations for the option. Lastly, you'll then be told about two options that they're considering. So there will always be two options, option one, option two. And you'll be given some information about what that option is. And then normally you'll then be given some uh, financial data relating to that option. It could be some financial data within the text, but the last two exam papers have, have included a nice uh, user-friendly table of financial data, different types of data for each option. Now, most importantly, for each option, you're given the same structure for the data. So, for example, if, uh, I don't know, if option one has some information on, let's say, uh, the payback period for investment appraisal, you'll also have the payback period for option two. If they gave you some information about the, uh, I don't know, the contribution per unit, maybe break even, you'd have them for both options. So the reason for that is to make it easier for you to compare the two options. Okay, so what type of options, what type of markets will you get? Well, when you turn the paper over, hopefully, I'm sure it will be an accessible market or industry. And both options will be in the same market. So, for example, uh, in June 2022, uh, it was all about educational resources and educational support. One of the options was going to be online teaching resources. Another option was running a tutoring business. Uh, go back, uh, back to June 2019. It was about they're going to be selling ice cream. How are you going to do it? Are you going to run an ice cream van or are you going to set up an ice cream store a pop-up store in a shopping centre. So you'll find that the options are both related to the same industry. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, this is all recorded, by the way, and I'll also make the PowerPoint available to download on the link once we're finished. So if you want to, uh, rather than writing it all down, uh, if you want to, you'll be able to go through this at your leisure. It could be a product. It could be uh, you know goods. Or it could be a service. We don't know. But either way, the options should be in the same industry. Now, we've mentioned you get given some financial information and a lot of people say, well, what am I going to get given? Well, the answer is we don't know until we see what the examiner decides to give you this time. But typically, and I've, what I've done is I've just gone back over the last four papers just to highlight what type of information was provided. So you won't necessarily be given page after page of financial data, but you will be given enough to be able to do some relevant calculations. So, for example, the last three papers... Uh, you've been given some information about the startup costs and uh, the finance that the business has available. We've also been given in every paper so far some information about what their forecasts are going to be for revenues, variable costs and fixed costs. So you've always been able to work out what the likely or forecast profit is going to be for each option. The last two papers, you could also have worked out the break-even output, which could potentially be a useful calculation. Uh, not always, but you sometimes see some cash flow data or some, uh, let's call it efficiency data, things like trade payables, inventories, that kind of stuff. That might be useful. And just once in the last four papers, as far as I can see, we actually were given some investment appraisal data. Uh, it seems to be pretty uncommon that. So who knows what might turn up next time, but it's not that common. But it has happened before. In uh, 2020, June, 
you got given some information for each option on the payback period and the net present value. You may, a question coming in, would you see any balance sheets? You might, but I suspect it's more likely that there might just be an extract from the balance sheet or the statement of financial position, as it's otherwise known. So, for example, it might talk about the need for inventories for the two option. It might talk about the likely trade payables for both. Uh, so I, I think it's unlikely you would see a full balance sheet. You might do, but more likely to be an extract, I would say. Um, what are we saying there? Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, Philip's uh, making the point. I've uh, done the U Unit 3 exam today. Good, hopefully it went okay. Uh, I've not seen the paper yet. Uh, not too many formulas that needed to be remembered. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, Unit 3, uh, lots of formulas to remember. Unit 7, you choose which calculations you do. But typically, uh, you have the information to be able to work out gross profit, gross profit margin, net profit, and uh, often you'll be able to be able to work out and break even output as well. So there will be some information that you'll be able to use to manipulate data to do some calculations. OK, so let's just quickly then go through structure. We've had a couple of people in the live chat looking at there saying, please go through the structure. So let's do that, shall we? Let's pick out what the structure is and uh, what to look out for in each part of it. Well, firstly, don't forget, I've mentioned that there are two activities. Each activity is a separate document. Activity one is the biggest. It's the report, 52 marks. And what I've done is, as we go through this, I've tried to highlight the, the most important pieces of information. So, uh, firstly, it's a report, is activity one. So it needs to be written as a report, word processed with suitable headings and structure and addressed to who the set or the task brief says you are addressing it to. Uh, and it must, most importantly, it must address both options. Now, don't forget, if you remember unit two, if you've done unit two, then you choose the option that you then develop. Not in unit seven. You must consider and develop and analyze both options before choosing which option you're going to recommend. So don't just pick one option and develop it. You must address both. And we look at things like, as we'll see, we'll look at cal calculations, we'll look at risks, we'll look at resources. And then most importantly, we then draw that together to state a decision, AF5. So next one, activity two. I was just picking up a question. It says, would you advise some um, from uh, Ye Big, I'll just say, <laughs> would you advise spending around two hours on the report? I would. I think two hours is spot on. Three hours, I would say 15 minutes reading through the information, uh, seeing what the market is, getting a feel for what information is there. And then I would go two hours on activity one and then leave yourself a minimum of 45 minutes to have a go at activity two, which is the presentation. And the reason for that is activity two draws from, is built on what you do in activity one. It's simply a way of presenting the key summaries, the key information from activity one. No problem about the name. So activity two is a presentation, 18 marks, and it's really... It's really summarizing the key, the key data. It's a pitch document. You're trying to convince someone about the merits of the chosen option and the justification for it. And it also needs to include speaker notes. But we'll come back to activity two in a couple of minutes. OK, so let's before we look at uh, what I want to do at the end of this session is just spend a few minutes going through the, the detail, each of the assessment focuses where each of the marks are awarded. However, let's just take a step back now and just highlight what the examiners are saying are the most important things for you to remember before you take Unit 7. So there's, there's a bit of detail coming about each of the different parts of each activity, and it's important to, to think about those. But what's coming in the next two minutes is the most important, I think, because the examiners are saying this again and again in their formal reports to to candidates and to teachers. So we must take account of this because many students won't. So firstly, financial analysis. We've mentioned this already, haven't we? You do need to do some financial analysis. And by analysis, I mean two things. Calculations that are relevant from the data given for both options, but then using, using that data to support and assess and evaluate those options. Okay, so for example, you might produce a break-even calculation for both options in terms of units. That's fine. 
So you need to share your workings. But the most important thing is you then use the results. Is one option, does it have a much higher break-even output? Does it have much higher fixed costs? So don't just do the calculations and leave them on the page. Use them throughout your response. And they come in really handy when it comes to making your decision, which is AF4 and AF5. And also, of course, don't forget the, the, key, the key data, the key calculations is a really useful summary to put into your presentation in Activity 2. Um, uh, Zachary is asking, do we get the entire case study uh, on Thursday? Yeah, no, no, you, get, you don't see anything before the exam. So everything you do and see is during that three hours. So there's no, pre, there's no pre-released case study. You don't, not like Unit 2 where you get to see the, uh, the research pack the day before. It's all within the three hours. That's why you need 15 minutes or so to read through it really carefully. Okay, so interestingly, the examiners are saying that some students, some candidates, as they say, actually don't carry out any financial analysis at all. Well, that's, a, that's unfortunate. It's really important if they give you the data to try to use it. Another weakness is that students just copy what's given and just paste it, copy and paste it in, or write it out into their word their documents. Well, that's not analysis, is it? That's called copying. It has no value. So we have to make we have to do uh, we have to do financial analysis. A second big weakness that's stopping learners from getting to merit and distinction is that they're not referring back to what the business wants to achieve. So that set task information information is really important. It will tell you what they want to achieve. For example, do they want to break even within a certain time period, maybe a year or two years? What's their objectives? What's their goal? You've got to relate that goal to your chosen option. Thirdly, in your report and in your presentation, you need to make sure you make reference to and use at least two decision-making models. You can use more than two if you wish, although there's not really a lot of logic to doing that but you do need to use at least two. And as we'll see in a minute, most students use SWOT and PESTEL. One or two uh, use things like uh, Porter's Five Forces, maybe Ansos Matrix. I was chatting to somebody who marks Unit 7, and she's marked hundreds, possibly thousands of scripts. She's never seen the five Cs model used ever, but there might be somebody out there who uses that. But whichever model you want to use, you need to use at least, at least two. Next, this is, I've put it over two slides here because this is really important. There is no need to consider any other option than the two options you're given, option one and option two. So don't waste your time coming up with option three and saying it's a better option, okay? The examiner has given you two options to consider and to recommend which one. Stick with those. Don't try to be clever and come up with a third option. Next, time management is crucial. You may, you may find this hard to believe, but it's easy to let time slip away. And the examiner's reports have said twice now that some students don't even start activity two. That's the presentation. So it's worth 18 marks. There are some easy marks to be had in terms of setting the presentation up using slides and titles and headers. So 18 marks, that's why you really must leave at least 40, 45 minutes to give it a good go. Don't leave those easy marks uh, not being awarded to. And lastly, and again, it's, it's not meant to be a warning, but it's really important. I don't want you to be the candidate whose grade is nullified and investigated by the malpractice team. You are not allowed to take pre-prepared templates, files with all the headings in, in or use them in the exam. You have to start with a, a clean file for both. So just don't do it. I'm sure you won't. Uh, some questions coming in. Um, Hussein saying SWOT and PESTEL is fine, but you're limited to the amount of marks you can get. Well, that's that's not strictly true. The as we'll see in a second, the assessment focus simply requires you to use at least two decision-making models to support your judgment. There's no requirement to use any particular models. You don't have to use Porter or Five Cs or Product Lifecycle. You choose. It can be any model any model on the BTEC national business specification, not just the ones that are limited or mentioned in the unit seven specification. So it's how you use those models that matters, not which ones you use. Uh, what else we got here? 
Robo is saying, could you use Porter's five forces instead of the five C's? Absolutely, you could. Absolutely. No doubt at all about that. In fact, it's probably a better model to use. But the vast majority of, of candidates use SWAT and PESTLE. But other models are available, no problem at all. OK. Um, Zachary is asking about the grade boundaries for, for merit. What did we say for merit? It was about 38, 39. I think we said, didn't we? 37, 38. OK. So let's now just finish off then by going through, just for five minutes or so, uh, some some specific recommendations from the examiners. So I've been through the last three examiner reports. I've had conversations. I don't uh, examine Unit 7, but I've spoken to people who've seen thousands of scripts. And what I've done is I've just summarized what the examiners are saying for each of the parts of the activity. So hopefully this will be useful. We'll go through it fairly quickly. As I say, you can always go back through this in your own time. But I just wanted to highlight where you can pick up some more marks for each part. We're going to start with activity one, 52 marks. And the first part is called information, data selection, and interpretation. And here is the, the marks are awarded here, not just for you know, a particular section, but if you make throughout your report sustained, relevant use of the case study. So that means not copying the case study out. OK? so. Don't just copy the information out. Draw out and be selective and pick out the key information and highlight those, maybe in a little table or write about them. But don't forget, do it for both options. Don't just list them. Don't just list the information. Explain why you think it's key information for each option. Yeah. And that way, it's a really useful scene setter for what follows in terms of uh, your financial analysis and your decision. Um, Oh, Jennifer, just going back to, um, come, I suppose we'll come back to this question on when we look at uh, models AF4. Jennifer's asking, can you still get a distinction even if you just do PESTLE and SWOT? Absolutely. Absolutely. The requirement for the assessment focus is two or more models used relevantly. And the vast majority of students use SWOT and PESTLE. And students who use SWOT and PESTLE get distinctions. So absolutely. Okay. so. That's uh, a general point, F1, about using sel being selective about information from the case, not just, not just writing it all out and then explaining why it's important. This is quite a, a, an important part, AF2. This is where we identify the resource implications of the two options. And we tend to categorize them. And I think it's a good technique to categorize them under the headings of human, uh, financial, time, and physical. So in fact, the examiners have said that's a good way of maybe a page for each option, splitting them into the resource areas there. So people, you know, what are the people requirements? Do they have the right staff? Do the staff have the training? Uh, what's the experience of the people involved in the business or those that are trying to get into the business? Finance, what's the financial requirement? Uh, physical would include things like computer systems and location, time. Do they have enough time to do what they need to do in each of the elements of the of the option? Are they going to be pushed ahead, pushed pushed the time? Could there be delays? It's those kind of issues that we explore, just in a two or three sentences for each for each option, to consider the resource implications of both options. So, for AF two, I would suggest splitting under those four headings for each option. Deal with option one, go through people time, finance, physical, then the next page, option two, resources, people, time, finance, and physical. And that way, with a bit of luck, as long as there's enough detail in there, you'll be picking up seven to eight marks by getting to the top, top mark band. AF3 is where your calculators come in, come in handy. So AF3 is all about the calculations. But as we've mentioned, this is so useful. So that's, therefore, it's worth spending some time on because you can bring in the results of your financial calculations and the implications to support your decision. But also the nice little summaries that you produce in the calculations go straight into your presentation as a nice summary of the financial forecast. So for I know there's only eight marks specifically for AF3, but actually it's whether you use them throughout the report that really does get you up the mark bands. So we're talking about calculations based on the information you're given, 
and then using them. So the examiners, the examiners I was speaking to uh, yesterday for Unit 7 saying, too many students, you're just copying the table, copying the data. That's not analysis. We've mentioned that before. So pick some calculations and then use them. So obviously show your workings. So for example, you might uh, do a working that shows, I don't know, uh, the gross profit and the gross profit margin for each option. So show your workings for each option. Don't forget the data is provided in the same format for both. So you should be able to compare the two quite easily. In fact, it's not a bad idea actually having a little table showing the two options and doing the calculations at the same time. So you can compare and contrast the results because uh, comparing the option is key. And then most importantly, use that data support to support what's coming up, which is AF4 and AF5. AF uh, couple of questions coming in, uh, but not about F3. So I think the key thing with the, with the financial forecasting bit or the financial calculations is don't, don't worry about doing thousands of calculations, but there will be at least two or three that you should be able to, be able to, should be able to do from the information you get given. So for example, let's make one up. Uh, let's say you can work out the profit for each option, and you might have some information that tells you how much capital they're going to employ in each option. Therefore, you could work out re return on capital employed. You might have some information on the, the average selling price for each option, the average unit cost or variable cost, and the therefore you could work out contribution per unit. You'll almost certainly be told the fixed costs for each option. So if you've got contribution per unit and the fixed costs, you'd be able to work out break-even output for each option. What does that show? Is that interesting? So it's that kind of analysis. It's that kind of financial calculation that helps then inform uh, the, the decisions that you uh, the decision on which option you take okay uh, so let's move on to af4 and af5 they're basically basically examined or marked together so af4 is really important 16 marks going for this in total this is where we start to draw together our financial analysis and our other thoughts on both options so we are looking at the what's involved in both how do they compare in particular, we need to focus on the risks involved. What are the risks? Are the risks of one higher than the other? What are the financial returns of one compared with the other? And then this is where we bring our models in. So this is where we need our SWOT and our PESTLE. Those two will be fine on their own, but you could also potentially bring in your Porters, Five Forces, or your Five Cs, or whatever it is that you want to use. So this is AF4 is where we bring in our models, our decision-making models. So we might say, for example, that, I don't know, option, option two seems to have, seems to play better to the strength of the business and explain how and why that is. That might be a reason why using SWOT analysis, that option two becomes our recommendation. It could be that we take a look at option two and say, and oh, actually there are too many threats from doing that. Why? What are those threats? Why does that make option two less valuable or less attractive maybe option one. So apply the model in that way. To, so apply your models to each of the options and then allow that to influence your decision, which means AF5. AF5 is the decision. Now here's the thing. The activity one and activity two, my understanding is they're marked separately. Okay. So don't leave your decision to the presentation in activity two. You must, 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 must. In fact, the examiner's mentioned this twice now. You must make sure that somewhere in that report is your decision as to which option you are recommending and why. If activity one does not include a very clear statement of what your recommendation is, then you get zero marks. You've lost eight out of 70 if you don't include it in activity one. So really, really important that you include your decision. My, my preference would be to include the decision at, at the end of the report, because I think that's, that's an obvious place to, to put it after you've been through your financial analysis, after you've used your decision-making models, but make sure it's in there. Don't leave it until the presentation in activity two. But clearly the most important thing is it's a convincing and clear decision, okay? And it's supported by what's gone before. It's supported by 
comments about the financial calculations. It's supported by how you analyze the decision using the models, for example, SWOT or PESTLE. So don't just say that's a decision, link back to uh, your analysis, link back to the models, and of course, link back to the aims and the goals of the business, which you'll find in the, in the, in the, um, the set text. Okay, there we go. So that's uh, AF5, the decision. Don't forget there are also marks going in activity one, 52 marks in total of those four are for presentation and structure. Hopefully some easy marks to get. If it's a, it's a word process document, so yeah, hopefully you use some nice headings, subheadings, paragraphs ni nicely laid out. Uh, maybe if you're using tables of data, nicely presented. Um, the main thing is be as sharp as you can. There's only four marks for presentation and structure. Most students get two or three fairly easily. All I'd say is just before you finish the assessment or before you finish activity one, just use your built-in spell checker and your grammar checker and just correct any obvious typos, any obvious errors. And maybe just have a quick read through and check that you've, you've not mixed up gross profit with operating profit or you've not, you've not written about kind of, uh, in pestle political and, I don't know, um, something else. <laughs> Philosophical, economic and social. So just make sure that you've, you've not left any glaring errors in there that might suggest to the uh, to the examiner that you don't know what you're writing about. Okay, so there we go. That's AF 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 52 marks. So let's just spend a couple of minutes to finish off with in terms of uh, the other bit, the 18 marks, the presentation. So I'll just repeat what I said right at the start. The examiners are saying some students don't even get to the presentation. So that's 18 out of 70 marks that you can't earn if you don't produce that presentation. So even if you're running out of time on activity one, you've got half an hour left, that is the time to stop and start work on, even if it's just a simple presentation to try to grab as many of those 18 marks as you can. The main thing about the presentation is that it is not just repeating what's in the report. So don't just start copying and pasting out thousands of words, paragraphs into your presentational slides. The presentation needs to be a pitch document, a convincing document. It needs to be a summary of the key points. Easy for somebody who might be persuaded to invest, for example, to look at. They don't want to see, you know, 500 words on a slide. So copying and pasting what you've just typed into your report is not a good way to go. Try to summarize the key points using bullets. Keep the slides nice and clean. The other thing to mention is that the decision should be stated in the presentation, the recommendation, because that's what the that's what the document's there for. However, it needs to be the same decision, the same recommendation that you've made in activity one. Don't change your mind in activity two and say, and I've changed my mind. In my report, I said I said option one is best, but having thought about it for a minute or two, I've decided to go for option two. It has to be the same decision. Now, don't forget it's a it's a presentation. So it shouldn't include anything new in terms of the analysis, the, ju the justification. However, it can include some clarifications and some extra detail. And a good place to put that is in the speaker notes. So don't forget, as part of this presentation, it needs to be slides with key bullet points, maybe a table of the key, key data. But also you need to include speaker notes underneath to help explain to the examiner the justification. So that's a good place to add some extra little bit of value. Six marks going for structure, six marks out of 18. So what are we looking for? Bullet points, definitely. Clear slides, so don't use transitions. Don't use clip art. Don't embed images, all that kind of stuff. No need for it whatsoever. Keep it really clean and simple and professional. That's what it's about. There's two reasons for that. One is because you'll be, you'll be given marks for a professional appearance. But secondly, it makes it a lot easier for the examiner uh, to, to review and to read. And uh, if there's detail, if you need detail, put it into the speaker notes rather than on the slides. But it's not about just copying and pasting all your stuff. There we go. So just a quick reminder, therefore, on the screen as to what the examiners have been saying. We've covered quite a lot there. Um, 
Simran's asking, how many slides do you recommend for the presentation? Well, yeah, you've got sort of 30, 40 minutes, but really, I mean, there's no, there's no minimum number or maximum number, but essentially you're, you're trying to firstly state what the recommendation is. You might then have one or two slides that are summarizing the key findings from your report, the key findings from the from your analysis, the key risk factors. Uh, you might have, you might, for example, have a slide that uh, summarizes your SWOT analysis and what it means. You might have a summary slide for your PESTLE analysis and what the implications are for the options. You might have a slide that says key financial forecasts and implications. So it's really up to you to to decide how best to present that. But the the key things are simplicity and 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 it being a summary rather than trying to feel as though you have to write a big detailed deck of slides. So I would have said five or six maybe slides should be enough, depending on how you how how you like to uh, to lay things out. Don't forget also though, it needs to keep coming back to the aims and the goals. So that presentation needs to stand alone. So in the same way that we've recommended an option in, in activity one in the report, we need to say the same thing in the slide presentation and state why that option you think you're going to recommend it because it, it best meets the aims and the goals of the uh, of the of the of the owners. Um, yeah, Mrs. H, great. Thank you very much for that contribution. Really need to include the financial decisions in the presentation. Absolutely right. So I, I would be thinking uh, a, a couple of a couple of summary slides, maybe one highlighting the key ratios that you've identified. Maybe the key the forecast profit for each of the options, whatever whatever calculations you've done, maybe the break-even output. So make sure you draw those financial calculations into your presentation. Just a simple table will do. And then most importantly, highlight with one or two bullet points maybe what the implications are from those. But definitely don't ignore your financial data that you did, that you worked so hard on in activity, uh, activity one. So, okay, we're almost there. Um, what have we got here? Uh, well, adding in, uh, Jane's asking, will adding in any theory provide any additional marks? Uh, well, really, the only time that theory comes in, other than just it being looking professional and using specialist business terminology, is is in is in the sort of decision making tools, isn't it? Really, it's all about being being good, clear communication. So I would be tempted not to try to fill any of this, either the report or the presentation, with lots of theory. You not you don't want to be spending, you know, five slides explaining forces, five forces, or Ansos matrix. Uh, applying the models is what it's all about, not not to impressing the examiner that you know every detail of all the decision making models. Uh, is there five? Ram was asking, is there five the conclusion? Uh, effectively, it is. It's it's within activity one. It's the recommendation, the decision. Yeah, that's why AF four. And AF5 are really sort of looked at together, I think, in terms of have you come up with a really clear, co coherent recommendation? So, yeah, think of that as the conclusion. But you need, to, we, you need to make sure it's in there. And secondly, it's justified and supported and links to the aims. Um, Pippichin's asking, how detailed do the speaker notes need to be for top marks? Well, there's no particular requirement for uh, the level of detail, but it needs to be sufficient for somebody to be able to understand. Uh, and support what's on the slides in terms of the bullet points. So typically with a, a slide, you'd be looking, let's say three or four bullet points, the key, the key points. You maybe have uh, maybe a sentence or two for each each bullet point or just a sentence for each, uh, just explaining what's, what's presented on the slide. Uh, Linda's asking, does the presentation focus on the option you've decided for or both? Uh, both. Don't forget, we need to address in both activities the fact we need to address both options, but make sure in the presentation it's clear within the presentation which option you are recommending. And you might even start by having the slide that says, you know, what follows is an analysis of the two options. However, we recommend option one. But it's the same with the report. You need to consider both options. Okay. Uh, Sim is asking, would you recommend creating income statements or forecasts for financial part? In a way, you are creating an income statement, aren't you? But but not a formal income statement. It, for example, if you're working out what the uh, the sales revenue might be or what the profit might be, you might be given the sales revenue. We don't know, do we? But uh, really, just using the information to try to get to a relevant ratio. Um, 
Ram is asking, would you recommend doing Pestle and SWAT or Ansoff and maybe 5C and SWAT? Because Pestle is really time consuming. Pestle is type, quite time consuming, but you've got quite a lot of time in this one. It's not as rushed, for example, as Unit 2, I would say. Um, so uh, it's up to you. I wouldn't recommend either. And I know on Unit 2, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about trying to encourage uh, learners to use the product lifecycle. Uh, and you could use that if you wish. Uh, but I don't have a thing against Pestle uh, on this one. Uh, as I say, five Cs, it's, it's pretty rare. I think I think it's pretty rare that it's used, but there must be some scripts out there somewhere. I think we've got another few seconds. What do we think? Any more questions? Hopefully it's been useful. I'll just scroll down here. Yeah, the number of questions coming in about um, decision-making models, the, the requirement is two relevant models used appropriately, two or more. There's no specific requirement for which ones they have to be. It can be any model that's relevant to your BTEC national studies. So it doesn't have to be 5Cs or PESTEL or SWOT. Um, it just so happens that the vast majority of uh, candidates, I think, use SWOT and PESTEL, partly because they're two very good models and also because they're familiar with them. And oftentimes the, the case of the information is, uh, is nicely written to be able to draw some information out for those. Okay. Um, somebody else, does it matter how much you write in the speaker's notes? Uh, do we have to write it like we are presenting? Yeah, that's actually not a bad, that's not a bad way to think about it. You know, let's say you've got two or three bullet points on the slide. What would you say for a minute or two about them? And it could well be that you could copy some of the information from your reporting and just tweak it slightly to, to create your speaker notes. Okay. Yes, great, great point for Mrs. H. So thank, by the way, thank you very much for supporting on the live chat. Some great support coming through from a number of experienced uh, BTEC teachers who are really making some really helpful supporting comments in the live chat. Uh, the comment here from Mrs. H, think of the mark, uh, think of it as uh, the speaker notes this is, as the uh, engaging the investor's eyes. Don't forget this, this presentation, this slide document is a pitch, isn't it? It's trying to, it's trying to convince somebody that uh, this is a good option. It's the best option. So the speaker notes will hopefully be part of that, isn't it? It's what you would say to say, yeah, I really think this is the best option and why. Robo saying timing wasn't an issue. Uh, you had 45 minutes left. If you're finishing two hours, fantastic. But m dare I suggest that there might be an opportunity to add a little bit more detail, perhaps in the SWOT analysis, perhaps in the uh, in the resources section, maybe add a bit more about people or time or physical. Dare I suggest maybe one more calculation or maybe go through uh, your justification and use, use every minute that's going. Because the beauty of Word documents and PowerPoint slides is that uh, you can go back and add stuff at any stage, can't you? So uh, great if you finish early, but uh, not everyone does. Uh, Ram was asking, what formulas should we revise or make sure we know? Well, of course, we don't know what financial information we're going to get given. But if, if, if it was me taking the exam, and I'm pleased it's not, I would make sure I know the formula for my profitability ratio, so my gross profit margin my profit margin or net profit margin and return on capital employed, uh, I would make sure that I can do break even. So I remember my break even formula as being uh, fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. I almost forgot it then. <laughs> uh, fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. Contribution, of course, is sales revenue less total variable costs. So that you, it may well be that you use that to get to the uh, contribution per unit. And then I would also remember margin of safety. So it could be that they have a forecast output. And if you've worked out the break-even output, then you'll be able to use the margin of safety. And that might, be a, that might be a useful piece of data that helps you decide which option is best. Uh, Zachary is saying, Jim, please, can you do my exam for me? Please, uh, your best place to do it. I'm too old, so I can't, unfortunately. Right, I think we're done. Sorry, apologies. I've gone on a little bit too long here. So hopefully, uh, for those of you who are still with me, hopefully it's been useful. Uh, don't forget, as soon as we finish this, uh, then we will, uh, YouTube automatically creates 
a nice recording. So uh, if you've got any more questions about Unit 7, we've got a, a day or so, haven't we, before the exam. I think it's on the 19th, I think, uh, for, for January 2023. Uh, please do add them into the comments section on the YouTube video, and I'll do my best to, to get an answer to you. And if I can't answer it, I'll find somebody who can. I'll also make a copy of these slides available on the download later this evening. So if you wish to, you can download those and just have a look through them. I wish you all the best as you enter the Unit 7 uh, assessment. Give it your best shot. Try to remember some of the things we've covered this evening. Most importantly, relax and just uh, give it a good shot. Three hours is a long time. Lots of opportunity to, to get some really good stuff done. And let me know how you get on, maybe by putting a post in the comments once the exam is finished. So I'm off now. <laughs> Many thanks for joining me. And as always, I wish you all the best in Unit 7.